Hello, today we are meeting Ragi Kadir Gamar from Sri Lanka and we'll be talking or stay, staying in silence about the truth. Hello. Namaste. Hey, nice to meet you. Uh, you came to Poland to do what? Ah, oh, good question. Um, so I try and share this uh, Advaita teaching, mm -hmm. dual teaching, um, because in my spiritual seeking, uh, when I met my teacher Ramesh Balsekar and discovered the Advaita teaching, mm -hmm. it completely changed my life. It um, it helped me more than anything else I had tried before. What did you try before? So I tried meditation, therapy, uh, Kundalini yoga, yoga, different kinds of healing practices. And in the outer, outer world, business, banking? I was an architect, uh -huh. I was a sportsman, uh, I did various things, mm -hmm. had an active life. Okay, and what is your line of your teachers? Who, who is the most famous teacher which can be found on Wikipedia or something? Like that? So if you Google Ramesh Balseka, uh -huh. there's lots of videos by him. And he wrote maybe more than 35 books. And uh, his teacher was Nisargadatta Maharaj. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in the West know Nisargadatta Maharaj because there's a book called I Am That, which was one of the first Indian Advaita books to come to the West. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's in that uh, form of teaching, but I've also been influenced by Ramana Maharshi, and I spent many years in Tiruvannamalai, uh, living near Ramana's ashram. So I draw from these different uh, teachers and teachings. It's all Advaita, but they have different flavors. Mm -hmm. but it's all the same message. What kind of practice is that? So, Ramesh used to um, encourage people to do what he called personal investigation. Mm -hmm. Looking to see if there is a doer of actions, or an individual doer of actions. I call it the author of actions. Mm -hmm. And he said, do personal investigation if you want to. Who does this? Yeah. The mm -hmm. seeker, the mm -hmm. ego, the mind, decides they want to go deeper. And usually the ego mind wants some kind of practice. Yes. Most ego minds want yes. some kind of practice. So Ramesh offered this as a kind of practice, but not in the formal sense of doing it every day as a discipline. He said, if you feel like it, have a beer or a glass of sherry, sit comfortably, turn the phone off, and just investigate. And if you want, we can go through that later. Yeah, later. Um, investigate by doing what? Because people always seek what to do. What to do, yes. So um, we basically try and find an action in our life mm -hmm. from the recent past. We can start with that. And it's something that we are convinced we are the author of. We're convinced I am the author of this action. Mm -hmm. I was in control of this action. And we investigate it by asking questions to ourselves, Was there a thought? Did a thought come up? And did that thought contribute to the action? And we look at four other things. Was there a memory? Did one of the five senses pick up on something? Did something happen in the natural or physical environment? Or did somebody or say or do something which directly led to our action? Mm -hmm. And as we do that, we discover that we're not in control of the thought, we're not in control of the past memory, we're not in control of our five senses, we're not in control of the natural or physical environment, and we're not in control of what the other person says or does. So the ego mind starts to realize all this is just happening. Mm -hmm. And the center of control, the center of belief of control, starts to get weaker and weaker and weaker. Okay, so this is one of the ways to self-realization. Okay, so what really does the ego do? So the ego thinks it's doing something, mm -hmm. but the ego discovers, I'm not the one doing it. It's happening. 
And then if the ego mind is open, and some ego minds are open, some are not, the ego mind might ask, if I'm not doing it, if I'm not the author, what is? Who is doing it? Mm -hmm. And then we have another concept in this teaching. We say, consciousness is the author of everything. Consciousness, God, life, universal energy. I use these words to mean the same thing. And then if the ego mind is ready to accept that, then am I separate from consciousness? Am I separate from God? And if the ego mind is ready, open, it will realize it has never been separate to consciousness, God. Mm -hmm. What if something bad happens to us against our will? So do we have will? Uh -huh. do What we do have you think? Do we have will? Only in the deepest consciousness, not in the ego. So this difference between the deepest consciousness and the ego, in what I share, mm -hmm. this difference doesn't exist. Deepest consciousness and the ego is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Deepest consciousness or shallow consciousness, any form of consciousness, is the ego. The ego is consciousness. There's never been a separation between these two. So the target is for the ego is to realize that we are one. Well, most egos are seeking because there's some suffering. Uh -huh. In our life we have some suffering. And I call that psychological and emotional suffering. We can look at physical pain and financial material pain later. So most seekers who come to spirituality are wanting to escape or they want the end of their suffering. Yes. And I say it is psychological and emotional suffering which most seekers are trying to escape from. For some seekers it's more like an existential suffering. Why am I here? Does God exist? But it's still a kind of suffering. Mm -hmm. The difference I make is that some people have had no major traumas in their past, in their childhoods. They've been loved, they feel loved, they feel secure, they have good jobs, good lives, they're healthy. But they're still spiritual seekers. They still have questions. Mm -hmm. So everybody's looking for some alleviation or end to some kind of suffering. Exactly. So in this teaching, what we try and encourage the ego to do is to look at itself, to question its own nature. We can go into the different kinds of suffering and the patterns and the stories, and that's useful. And I even suggest to people you can use some relative techniques psychological techniques, healing techniques, various techniques. Mm -hmm. But primarily in this teaching, Advaita, it's a little different from many other spiritual teachings. We're going to the source of the ego, the source of the I thought. I, me, mine, myself. These little thoughts. So we don't look outside for the solutions. We just go to the source of this I thought. And the core of this I thought is two beliefs. I am separate. I am the author of my actions. Mm -hmm. So coming back to what, what you said, do we have will? What that means is do we have free will? Yeah. Is it my will for something to happen or not happen? So we can allow ourselves as the seeker to explore this. Is it really my will? And what do we find? If we look at the investigation, we find that thoughts just come and go. Yes. Like Nobody clouds. knows their next thought. Sorry? Like clouds. Like clouds. And we can't control the clouds coming and going. Mm -hmm. So in meditation, vipassana, other meditations, we can discover that quite quickly. The same thing with body sensations. Mm -hmm. The same thing with emotions. They come and they go. The same thing with everything our senses are picking up. They come and they go. And we discover that what the Buddha was saying, which everything is impermanent, is actually true. From our direct experience, we discover this. Nothing is permanent, everything is changing. Mm -hmm. Then at a certain point, we discover, ah, but there's something observing all this. Something witnessing it. Mm -hmm. Something aware of it. Watching, recognizing. I call this awareness. Different teachers call it different things. Something seems to be in the background and it's watching all these objects come and go. So the ego that realizes this from direct experience 
suddenly recognizes, I can't just be a thought. I can't just be a belief. I can't just be any physical, emotional, energetic condition. Then what am I? Ah, maybe I am this awareness. Maybe I am this witness. And that's a really great step. And the ego discovers that. Mm -hmm. But then some egos get attached to this. That I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not the emotions. I am this awareness. And it creates a very strong attachment for some egos that are seeking. And the ego realizes that I am observing the observer. So No, that's still the ego. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said. The ego claims it is observing itself. Mm -hmm. yeah? And it gets more and more subtle as we go deeper into this. Mm -hmm. The ego starts coming up with all kinds of claims. So that's why ultimately, at some point, if we want to, there's no obligation, we can look at who's claiming this? Who's saying I am awareness? Who's saying I am the observer? Who's saying anything? What is this I thought that's saying this? So then the question is not about free will or not free will. The question is not about peace or no peace. The question isn't even about consciousness or no consciousness. The question is simply, what is this sense of myself, this I? Mm -hmm. And that was the basis of Ramana's teaching for nearly 50 years, and this is the basis of the Advaita teaching. Okay, so what is the condition that some people pick it up very early and for some it never happens in this lifetime? Pick what up? The seeking? The seeking and discovering who is watching. So there are different levels of discovery. Discovering who is watching is only the first step. Mm -hmm. It's not the last step. It's a useful step towards deepening the understanding. But many people, when they discover that, they feel their search is over. Because it's a very comfortable place to be. Mm -hmm. And for the ego, it's a very comfortable belief. I am awareness. And getting rid of some part of the suffering at this stage. And some part of the suffering seems to dissolve. Mm -hmm. But if we're honest with ourselves, it comes back. It goes, it comes back. And some seekers even get frustrated because they recognize that for 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more, they've recognized they are awareness, they know intellectually they are consciousness God, but the suffering still comes back. They still get triggered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so That's why I say it's only one step in the understanding. So it's maybe, not the ultimate understanding. Maybe the cause of it is that some part of the suffering is stuck in the body somewhere and needs to be released. So that's a relative explanation. But the real cause of it is the ego has not discovered what it really is. On the journey to this ultimate discovery, mm -hmm. as you say, unblocking blockages, letting the energies flow, healing certain things in our past, all that kind of thing, is very, very useful. And I highly recommend it to everybody. And I went through that process myself. But ultimately, even that is not going to lead to the final understanding of what this I thought is. Because the I thought is still claiming something, isn't it? Yes. It's claiming, if I unblock this energy, then I will be something. Either it's imagining it, or it's feeling it. Mm -hmm. So there's always a claim. Some kind of a claim, some kind of a statement. I am this, I am that, I am this, I yeah, am that. Yeah, like bricks in the house. If you get rid of all the bricks, you don't have the house. So you dissolve the ego when you unstuck everything, yeah? Kind of, but what we're looking at here is that the ego is needed for life. The ego is in a useful body. construct. Mm -hmm. The ego and the body to go together. When there's no body, there's no ego. And every night in deep sleep, the ego disappears. Mm -hmm. The ego is the I thought. And with the I thought, all the stories of who we are, and who everything is, and who the world is, disappears in deep sleep. Then during the day, many, many times during the day, the ego disappears. But we don't stop functioning. 
you're riding a bicycle or driving a car, cooking or dancing, doing some activity, even a brain surgeon, and the ego is not present. Yes. Yeah? There's a different part of the mind functioning and doing the task that needs to be done. So when the ego discovers it is not in control and it is not needed for life to be lived, the ego itself can relax. If you are professional at something, it means that you have the memory in your subconscious mind and you did, did it over and over thousands of times. So it's not the consciousness, it's not the ego, it's your subconscious mind. This is what uh, psychology explains. Yes, but psychology only goes so far. Mm -hmm. And this is the difference between psychology and the Advaita teaching. So psychology explains it the way you do. Mm -hmm. And they classify it as conscious, unconscious or subconscious. And various other classifications. But they don't look at what is this that's claiming it. What is, this, what is there that's believing it's conscious, subconscious or unconscious. That's where Advaita takes us to the next step of understanding. The word Advaita means knowledge, yeah? It means non-duality. Okay. Ah means non, Dvaita means duality. Okay. So all the non-dual teachings, even Zen or parts of Buddhism, the Tao teachings, the early Sufi teachings, even the early Christian teachings, are all in a way non-dual teachings, Advaita mm -hmm. teachings. But Advaita teachings in India go back 8,000, 10,000, maybe more years. Uh, I'm sure you watched the film Matrix. Yeah. How would you compare the knowledge from the film with Advaita? So, the Matrix was pointing out the first step. We're not just this. Mm -hmm. Then what are we? And in the Matrix, they showed that you can come out of the Matrix. Yes. And then they described and showed the real world. Yes. But in the Advaita teaching, the real world is not the matrix or the absence of the matrix. It's not the real world or the absence of the real world. What we are is something even beyond this, but including these two. Mm -hmm. So in the matrix, they show the duality of the matrix and the real world. That's shown clearly, the duality. And you can move from one to the other. And that's what we're doing in life. We move from pleasure to pain. Understanding to confusion, light to dark. So is it worth to get out of the matrix or we can skip that part? We can simply say it's our destiny or not. If somebody is going to seek, they don't choose to seek, do they? Mm -hmm. Like for example you and I, we didn't choose how we were going to start to seek. The seeking started. And for some people it starts at a very young age. For others it starts much later in life. So even how the seeking starts and then how the seeking unfolds has never actually been in our control. Okay. We can say it's a gift or grace, we can say it's destiny, we can say it's prescripted, different ways of describing it. But if we look at our own seeking, we will admit we've never really been in control of this process. Okay, the word karma, does it exist or not? for whom it exists and for whom not. So if you've understood that you're fundamentally consciousness, mm -hmm. you're fundamentally God, life, the universal energy, what is karma? Karma is, uh, are the effects of what we do. So if I understand that I am not the doer, <clears throat> there is no karma for me. Exactly. So as long as you believe you're the doer, karma exists as a belief, mm -hmm. as a concept. And I collect the effects of it. As a belief, yeah. you collect the effects. But you see, one belief is built on another belief. Mm -hmm. So if you believe you are the doer, the author of actions, then underneath it you believe you are separate. But you're not conscious of that other belief. Mm -hmm. yeah? But are we really separate? No. So if we've never been separate beings, and this is what quantum physics is saying, all the particles in my leg know exactly what the particles in your leg are doing and the air and the camera and the carpet and the room. All the particles know. It's like a 
infinite intelligence, a matrix of intelligence that just knows. The ego at some point, around about one and a half to two and a half years old, is born. We're not born with the ego. Yes. The ego comes later. The I thought appears. And then this is conditioned by everything we experience in life. And it's continuing to be conditioned. So even this teaching is a new form of conditioning. Yes? Yes. So at any moment, that belief, I am separate, can disappear. And it actually does every night. That's what I was trying to explain. And during the day, when it disappears, I am separate, I am the doer or not the doer, all the stories of who we are, then what are we in that moment? We haven't died, we haven't fallen into an unconscious state, we're not in some samadhi state. What are we in that moment? So we can't actually say what we are because the thinking mind is absent. So there's no commentary, there's no description. But afterwards, something in the mind, in the ego, recognizes there was an absence of me in that moment. I was not there in that moment. And rather than feeling scared, that feels quite interesting. That feels quite reassuring. So the more and more that happens, and if the mind ego is open, it recognizes there are moments in my life, what we call my life, where the I thought, me thought, ego is present. There are other moments where it's not present. So maybe I am both of these. And maybe I don't have to get rid of one to become the other. And that's what I really liked about my guru's teaching. Mm -hmm. Because he was not saying we had to get rid of anything. He was pointing more that once we realize what our fundamental nature is, an automatic acceptance of everything starts to happen. What about the body? If someone is healthy, in good shape, is it easier to start seeking and find what is really going on? Or the other way around? If someone suffers and suffers and suffers, is it any kind of a rule that this way is better or, or this way? There doesn't seem to be a rule. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of examples of different people's lives, even different Advaita teachers, for example. I know one Advaita teacher who was an alcoholic and a drug addict for most of his life. Mm -hmm. And then one moment he woke up in the morning and he had no desire to drink or take drugs. And it was the first time that it ever happened in his life. And in that moment, the thought came, I did not decide this. How did it happen? And that's how his seeking started. Other people have been murderers. There are stories of yes. murderers or kings, violent people, who discovered the Advaita concepts and pointers, or other teachings, and realization happened, or the seeking started, realization happened. So there doesn't seem to be any correlation at all between the state of the body, or the state of the mind, or the state of the emotional body. And that's what's interesting. Because the mind, what we call the mind, but specifically the thinking mind, is always looking for a reason. Why is this happening? And it's just a habit based on thousands of years of education. Mm -hmm. But if we ask our body, and we can just put our hands here, we ask our body any question, we get an answer. We ask the energy field, we get an answer. We ask the heart, we get an answer. Then we have four answers from different parts of our being. And often, the mind is saying one thing, and the other three parts are saying another thing. So it's a way of easily checking from what I call intuitive intelligence. There's intellectual intelligence, mm -hmm. and then there's intuitive intelligence. And we haven't learned to access this intuitive intelligence. Okay, uh, in the past, ancient past, as humanity, were we kind of misled by someone or something, or we just did it? And if so, why? It's again, it's a great question. So if we believe there was a separate me, a separate you, mm -hmm. then maybe somebody misled us. But okay. if you come back to, has there been a separate you or me, then it's very clear that God consciousness is misleading itself. 
Well, I like to say playing hide and seek. Mm -hmm. God consciousness pretends to hide. Where am I? Where am I? Who am I? And pretends to look. And then one day, oh, well, I've actually always been here. Some people call it a play, a divine play. Some people call mm -hmm. it a dance, yes? In the Hindu scriptures, it's described as a spider that weaves its web and then takes the web back into itself. Mm -hmm. So the web is the manifestation, is life, creation. And everything happens on this web, in this web. And then the spider takes it back into itself and then out again and in again. We have, uh, in Poland, we have a funny... A poem for children where a teacher is looking for his glasses, always having them on the nose. Exactly. Uh, okay, what about uh, practices with uh, stimulating chakras? Some people might have better visions, better understanding when they clean the chakras, open the chakras. Uh, is it necessary or not? What do you think? So just from my own experience and my yeah. concept is we can't really know what is going to contribute to what. Mm -hmm. So for one body-mind organism balancing cleaning chakras could be helpful to relax and open the mind, ego. For another person it could cause a greater attachment to states and energies. And I talk a lot about this. Why do we get so attached to states and energies and experiences? Usually because they bring us some pleasurable state. And we're trying to escape painful states. So naturally the mind-ego body likes the pleasurable experiences, mm -hmm. energies and states. And then of course in some teachings we're encouraged to purify to get to that state, then to get to the next level, etc., etc. So this creates a strong attachment, desire, in the mind-ego. And a belief that, if I ultimately get to that permanent state, then I'm going to be free forever. But the opposite is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Because all these ideas of states, energies and experiences are still based on the belief, I am a separate body-mind organism. So that's why I said it gets more and more subtle. And with some of these practices, the levels and the layers and the understanding and experiences get extremely subtle, even with the siddhis. The siddhis are powers. Mm -hmm. So there are yogic practices to develop certain siddhis. Yes. And it's amazing because actually the number of siddhis is almost infinite. And if we look at the legends, legends of human beings flying, yes. being in many places at the same time, even the stories of Jesus, he had six cities, at least six cities. Yeah? Yes. So the seeker is so desperate to get out of suffering that sometimes the seeker, the ego, will believe anything it's told. So what I say to people is, do you want something that's impermanent? Or do you want something that's permanent? And you decide for yourself. If you want something that's permanent, it cannot be an energy. It cannot be a state, it cannot be an experience, it cannot be any sensation. It can't even be an understanding, because understanding comes from thoughts. Mm -hmm. So then what is it? Then at least the ego realizes it's not this, this, this and this, and it stops chasing those. It still enjoys them if they happen, because they happen spontaneously sometimes, but it's not chasing them. It learns from the experience, but it's not chasing the experience. And then gradually the ego realizes, I cannot be just an energy, an experience, a state, a sensation, or something else. Then what am I? And we're back to this question then, what am I? Mm -hmm. What am I? And then why are we here on this planet? So can you see that even the question why comes from believing I am here. Mm -hmm. There is a ragi here. The question comes from there. Yes? Yes. So all questions come from this deep, deep belief I am this separate object. Now if we look at how this belief is formed, it's really interesting. 
if we look at little babies, between the time they're born and about one years old, nine months, one years old, before they're speaking, before they've learned words and language, they're extremely curious. They want to touch everything, taste everything, put it in their mouth. Because actually, in those first few months of life, we have no experience of being separate. There's no physical sensation of separation. We can recognize different surfaces and tastes and textures, and we're actually curious to taste everything because there's a knowing, this is me. But we're not thinking this. So we go towards something because it's like we're meeting ourself. And I'm just giving a conceptual explanation. Then at a certain point, we learn language. So we learn that this form is ragi. Yes. But we're still talking in the third person. I would say ragi is hungry. Ragi wants the ball. Then the next interesting thing happens. The I thought appears in what we call the mind. And that's the birth of the ego. The I thought is the ego. So then Ragi says, I am hungry. I want the ball. But then, because of conditioning, we are told, indirectly or directly, you are actually a separate body-mind organism. And indirectly or di directly, we are all told, you are not perfect. There's something wrong with you. You are separate from God. But... If you try hard enough, if you behave really well, work hard for 40 years, work hard for 40 years, or search spiritually and do all your practices, one day you will realize who you are, or you'll be one with God. Now imagine if we didn't have the last part of the conditioning. Imagine if the ego is born, the I thought is born, and after that moment, everybody tells us, you are one with life, you are one with God. You are consciousness. You are perfect. You can never make a mistake. We wouldn't have this. Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't have a TV a channel. Diff different world. There wouldn't be any seeking to find out who we are because all of us would know who we are consciously. Mm -hmm. Now, that knowing from childhood, which came from before we were born, which is here during life, and it's always present after death, is what we're talking about. I call it a knowing. It's not knowledge. It doesn't appear as thoughts. It can't be really described. So we can only point to it. I can't call it a truth. I just say it's a concept. But it's always here. And it's covered up a bit like the clouds you talked about. We know the sun is there behind the clouds. How do we know the sun is there? At some point we've seen the sun. We've directly experienced the sun. And it's the same with this knowing. It's never left us. It might have been a very small voice or a very small light. But it's always here. So basically what we're trying to do with this teaching, with these concepts and pointers, and even the practices, is just peel away, uncover all the beliefs, ideas, concepts that cover it up. Is there any true religion on this planet? The religion which really leads people to the goal. First of all, it depends what you mean by goal. It's self-realization. So, if you accept, I don't know you well enough to say whether you do accept or not, maybe you can tell me, do you accept you are already consciousness? Already God? Yeah. And I can ask anybody who's watching. You can ask yourself, am I consciousness? Am I life? Am I this universal energy? Even if you don't feel it all the time, is there a part of you that knows this? Even if sometimes you forget it, even if sometimes it's covered. Is there a part of you that knows this? Yes. So then, who becomes realized? What is realization? If you're already consciousness, already God, life, universal energy. The one who thinks that he is separate. Right. So the thought, I am separate, disappears. Yes. And that's what realization is. It's not a body-mind organism that becomes realized. Mm -hmm. Because as we said earlier, we've never actually been separate body-mind organisms. 
even the ego, which is believed it's separate, hasn't actually existed as an entity. Because if we look for it, we can't find it. So it's a thought that disappears. So what is the thought? The thought that disappears is, I am separate. Okay, but technically, what is the thought? What are thoughts in general? Yes. Oh, we can just say forms of energy, vibration or frequency. Uh -huh. So, if we think the same thing many times, it hardens, yes? So, it's hard to dissolve it after some time. Again, that's a belief. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, one belief will form another belief. But it's not necessarily sequential. Mm -hmm. And as you said, as we talked about earlier, we don't know what the exact patterns are going to be. At some point the mind has learnt belief as an energy, a frequency, whatever, and it hardens. Mm -hmm. So then that belief colors all the other beliefs, or some of the beliefs. Yes. Yeah? Yes. This is what's happening to us all the time. So we're never really listening or seeing somebody or something fresh. It's always conditioned by our experience from before. Mm -hmm. And that's quite normal. Yeah. We have to live like that in a way. And some of that conditioning is very useful. It keeps us safe. It allows us to wash ourselves, feed ourselves, have relationships, work, lots of things. But when it comes to spiritual seeking and trying to find out who we really are, this conditioning, this collection of beliefs actually is a limitation. It's a block. Yeah. It's, it's a trap. Heavy. So if you're Some. open to the idea that actually thoughts are not forming anything solid, mm -hmm. then you're open to the idea that actually thoughts and thought structures are just coming and going all the time. In deep sleep, there are no thoughts, thought structures. When we wake up in the morning for a few seconds, There's no I thought, so there's no other thoughts, there's no identity, there's no personal story. Then the five senses become active, and some thoughts might come, but as labels or descriptions to what is being perceived. That's a bird sound, alarm clock, duvet, whatever it is, yes? They're just descriptions, labels of what is being perceived by the five senses. Then the I thought comes and all the stories come. Mm -hmm. And so one of the stories is, my thoughts have become hardened, or my thoughts need to be looser, or my this, my that. Yeah? Yes. But is it true? Where does this claim, my, come from? From previous thoughts and experiences. Exactly. Conditioning. Mm -hmm. thoughts, experiences, even genetic inheritance, DNA. Yes. Yeah? And now they've found recently, I think just in the last few months, or maybe last year, I read an article where they found the source of memory in DNA. I talk about it as cellular memory. Mm -hmm. So there's cellular memory which we've inherited in the DNA, and then there's cellular memory in the cells of this body-mind organism. So there's DNA memory, and cellular memory combined, genes and conditioning. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now the cellular memory in the body, information is being added to that every second of every day. That's what's called conditioning or experience. And all that contributes to every thought, every choice, every action we make. And besides that, also the memory of the place. Memory of the place, the memory space. of the smells, memory of the energies. The unconscious memories as well as the conscious memories. Okay, uh, what about the time? Does it exist or not? And where it exists? If so? So if we look at it from a spiritual perspective, the spiritual teachings, they're basically telling us, like in the Hindu teachings, Brahman, the word Brahman is used for the word consciousness or God. Mm -hmm. Brahman is everything, everything is Brahman. So space and time are also Brahman. Yes. Consciousness is space and time. But consciousness, the word consciousness, the concept consciousness, is also the absence of space and time. So we can say space and time is manifested consciousness. Unmanifest consciousness, there's no space and time. 
but it's still consciousness. Yeah? Manifest consciousness, there's space and time, and all the objects, that's what duality is. Mm-hmm. Unmanifest consciousness, no space and time, and no duality. Alpha and Omega. Prior to Alpha and Omega. Okay. See, Alpha and Omega still exist in duality. Okay. They're descriptions of things which are not things. But prior to duality is what we're pointing to, non-duality. I can just add then about the Big Bang. Uh-huh. So now science is telling us there's this thing called the Big Bang. And there's a very um, interesting uh, quantum physicist who's an Indian. I think he's still alive. And he met my teacher, Ramesh Balsekar. And I think his name is Goswami. Yes. And there's a beautiful video of the two of them talking about it. The science, the, the scientist and the spiritual teacher, the sage. So from the quantum physicist's point of view, the Big Bang happened. Now Goswami is one of the first people, I think, but I'm not sure, to say that the whole of existence happened in a block. It's not actually evolving. But because of the way time and space are experienced in this three-dimensional, fourth-dimensional form, we have an impression that time and space is sequential and that there's evolution. But Goswami is saying, no, everything was created in the moment of the Big Bang as one block. That means all galaxies, all universes, multiverses, all dimensions for infinity. And he's one of the first people, I think, which is saying exactly what the spiritual teachings have been saying, which is that life just is. Consciousness is. Brahman is. And we, what we believe is the we, have never been separate from this what is. Okay. Brahman, Atman, what is the difference? So as far as I understand, Atman is referred to as the soul. The Supreme Soul. So again, if there's only one Atman, then there are seven billion people on the planet. And we can say seven billion souls. Seven billion body-mind organisms. And like the waves on the ocean, every single Atman or Paraatman soul is unique, individual, and has certain characteristics. But none of them have been separate to the Atman. Like the wave has never been separate to the ocean. Mm -hmm. So as the ego starts to realize, I definitely exist as a unique body-mind organism, and I even feel separate. But what I've actually always been is consciousness, Brahman, God. Then there's no paradox anymore. We are both this, feeling separate, personal, relative, and we are also what is absolute, impersonal infinite. Okay, why is so much suffering on this world? That's, that's one of the best questions because that comes to the core of duality. Mm-hmm. So that's why I, I also like this teaching and I like sharing this teaching because it can become very practical in our daily life. And my teacher Ramesh was a banker all his life, so he was a very practical man. I was an architect I'm not so practical, but I try and be practical. So if we look at anything that's happening in the world, why is it happening? So what the teaching basically is saying, pointing to, is that for this to happen, this has to happen. Like two sides of a coin, love and hate, Mm -hmm. male and female, good and bad, emptiness and fullness. That's the basic duality of life. So suffering happens because there is no suffering. Pain happens because there is pleasure. And for the ego mind, based on genes and conditioning, it's quite difficult for a lot of us to accept this. Because we've been taught and conditioned to believe that there's something pure, good, godly. And then there's something bad, evil, devilish. And this one's wrong and this one's right. But more importantly, We have a strong preference for pleasure and not for pain. Apart from the masochists, we have a preference for pain and not for pleasure. Mm -hmm. So the body-mind organism is naturally attracted towards pleasure 
and therefore believes pleasure is better than pain. How to solve that? If we can see and we can look at nature, that duality exists in nature and it's very obvious. If the tree doesn't fall and rot and provide food for the worms and the other creatures, the fertilizer, the soil, then the new plant can't come up. So creation and destruction is a natural cycle. Life and death is a natural cycle. But the minute we come to the human mind or body, we've forgotten this. We've become disconnected. And we can see the origins of that in our human history. Certain philosophies, certain teachings, have started to tell us that the human and the human mind is the most important thing and at the center of the universe. In Europe, it was the Renaissance period, mm -hmm. when suddenly certain philosophers decided to start teaching this. And so we became more and more disconnected from what we call nature, the natural environment. And as a result, we became more and more disconnected from our emotional body, our physical body, and our energy body. And the mind intellect became the most important thing. So wherever we are on the path, mm -hmm. there's some openness. There's always some openness, some readiness. We don't know what's going to happen next. Yes. And Ramesh described this like a staircase of a hundred steps. So we might think we're on the third step. But actually maybe we're halfway up the staircase. Maybe we're on the last step. Or we might think we're on the last step, but actually we're only in the middle. So the ego mind never really knows where it is on an imaginary path that it has created. So the seeking can end at any moment. So should we seek or not? We don't have any choice. The seeking is happening. Okay, but is it good to seek very practically and do something and try hard? Is it useful or not? My general suggestion is just test it from your own experience. Mm -hmm. Whatever you hear, whatever you read, whatever you watch on these videos, test it from your own experience. Trusting in the teacher, or the book, or the mountain, or something else, the external teacher, the external guru, is very useful. Because it creates an openness in the mind, ego, but also an openness in the heart. And there's something that happens in this trust, which helps to deepen the understanding. But for most of us, at some moment, we have to test it from our own direct experience. Is it true for me? Does it make sense for me? Is it clear for me? What's happening in my life? And in that way, it becomes practical. For example, I meet many people on the spiritual path, even many people coming to the Advaita teachings, who are still experiencing a lot of emotional and psychological suffering. And primarily they're blaming themselves, mm -hmm. they're blaming the other. They're feeling guilty, they're feeling shame, they may be hating themselves, hating the other, and they've got a lot of pride. These five things are what my teacher categorized as the main forms of psychological and emotional suffering. Blame, guilt, shame, hatred, and pride. And that leads to worry, expectation, anxiety. So many seekers are experiencing incredible periods of bliss, peace, liberation, oneness. But then the next moment, they're experiencing blame, guilt, shame, hatred, and pride, worry, expectation, and anxiety. So if that's happening, you know that something here within the body-mind organism has not totally integrated this intellectual understanding, hasn't totally integrated the experience. So don't lie to yourself. Take it as a gift, as an opportunity, to look. And you can either look straight at the I thought ego. What is it resisting? What does it want? What does it does not want? But the ego I thought is tricky. So it will not admit to itself often whether it's seeking or not. Many people say, I'm not seeking anymore. I'm just here out of curiosity. But that's not true. And I was the same. And I was going to satsang over and over again for nearly a year, and I was saying to myself and others, I'm not seeking anymore. Then one day, it was painful, I had to ask myself, then why do you keep going to satsang? Why do you keep reading the books? 
and I realized I was still looking for something. I had found what I always wanted, which was inner peace. I was comfortable with myself and comfortable with the other people in my life, particularly my family, my friends, my past. So I was experiencing peace, more happiness, more self-acceptance, more self-love. But I was still seeking something, and I was really annoyed to find that I was seeking enlightenment, self-realization. It wasn't what I was seeking before. Mm -hmm. I had picked it up like a virus in satsang. I call it a virus. Mm -hmm. This idea there's enlightenment and I can get it, I had picked it up in satsang. So I thought, okay, this is what I desire now. Don't deny it. Let's look at it. And I was lucky. I asked Ramesh a few questions. He cleared up my intellectual confusion. I read a few chapters in some of his books on enlightenment. That cleared up all the questions. So I knew exactly what it was and what it was not. But it was that moment of brutal honesty which allowed that other door to open and for the seeking to unfold. But if I had said, no, I'm not seeking, I was lying to myself. Mm -hmm. And then the remains of the suffering, if they're meant to unresolve or dissolve, remain a kind of a blockage, a kind of an attachment. And if we look at that for a moment, it's really interesting that all of us actually like our suffering. There's a part of the ego structure which likes the suffering. Either we like it because it's a familiar identity, or we like it because we have a victim image, or a savior image, or a warrior image, something like that. Or yeah? well, we actually like the energy, the pain. We like this feeling of seeking, maybe. We like the process of seeking. I meet many people when the seeking is starting to really end intellectually, and then they say, but I'm scared now. What are you scared of? Well, who will I be if I'm no longer seeking? It's kind of addiction. It's a kind of addiction. But what's important to recognize is it's not just an intellectual, egoic addiction. It's actually physical, energetic, and emotional. So when we apply this brutal honesty to ourselves, if we have the opportunity to do it, if it happens, then it reveals something else. And I think that's very important in my opinion, in the spiritual circus we have at the moment. So many different things are being offered. Yeah, and it really is like a shopping center of spirituality. So How does the seeker decide which thing to choose? Mm -hmm. So, practically, if something bad happens, how can we look at the situation to be the most practical? I would have to say, it depends on the person and it depends on that level or state of understanding. If somebody is familiar with the Advaita teachings, for example, since we're talking about that today, then just asking a very simple question, is it true? So this mental commentary comes up, I'm useless, I'm stupid, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Most of us have something like this. If we ask ourselves, is it true? Straight away, there's something in us that says, no, it's not completely true. So if it's not true, then it opens the door to asking, well, then what is true? If I'm not stupid, useless, and something else, then what am I, who am I? And that's a way of coming back to what am I, who am I? Or, many mind egos don't like coming straight to the I for various reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's why Ramesh focused more on not being the doer. And if we look at the way the teaching changed between Nisargadatta Maharaj and Ramesh, that's also really interesting. Because Maharaj, even though he talked about not being the doer, he was pointing more to, you are that. That you are. That Tvamasi. And actually the title of the book could have been, That I Am not I am that. Mm -hmm. yeah? So, so Maharaj is pointing more to that. And Ramesh was like that at the beginning of his teaching as well. And then I think he saw many people still experiencing a lot of psychological and emotional suffering, even though they had understood that I am. And they were repeating it to themselves. And at some level it had helped them in their life. 
But the root of the psychological and emotional suffering was still in the belief, I am the doer, I am the author. So when the, when the seeker is confronted with this concept, do you believe you are the author or the doer? What do you say? There's no escape. The ego has to take a position, or the ego can say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But something is revealed when we ask ourselves that. So if you don't want to go to, is it true, what is this, who am I, then you can try the investigation into actions. Am I really the doer? Am I really the author? Okay, so it means that to make our life easier, or the easiest, uh, it is better to be honest to myself, the most honest as much as we can. So this makes life easier. Less suffering and easier we can discover who we are. Yes or no? I think it's, it's a good question you raise because all of us trying to look for or find the ultimate Mm -hmm. method, the ultimate technique, which is going to fix our problems, basically take away our suffering. Because we are lazy, which is also a concept. We're lazy, it's a habit, mm -hmm. various reasons. But if we look at it honestly and openly, is there any one truth in the world? Yes. <laughs> What would you say that is? Uh, the truth which you uh, explained in the beginning, that we are the one, that from us, this is the truth. So for me, and the way I share it, and the way my teachers sh shared it, this is still a concept. We'll just look at this quickly and we'll come back to your question. You see, if you say, that I'm asi, that I am, it's putting it in a kind of a positive statement. Mm -hmm we would logically and in terms of language and in terms of duality have to say that I am not. That I am, that I am not. So, it, so this makes duality anyway? Yes. Because anything we say is in duality. So if I say I am consciousness, logically, to be clear, I would have to say I am not consciousness. Because then it's the expression of both parts of the duality. Mm -hmm. That's why any sentence or word itself cannot be the truth. There's always the opposite somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, if I say I am consciousness and I am not consciousness, these are still both intellectual statements which come from thoughts and words. Now, what am I when there are no thoughts and words? I cannot say I am consciousness. I cannot say I am not consciousness. So we have a third thing which cannot be named. But from our direct experience, the third thing, which is not a thing, actually exists, does not exist. So then we have three expressions, the positive, the negative, and the absence of both. I don't know if you're familiar with Wei Wu Wei. Have you heard of Wei Wu Wei? No. Wonderful Irish lord who wrote under the name Wei Wu Wei. Pure Advaita, pure Advaita. Seven books, which were later discovered to be his books. And in these books he uses this kind of language, the positive, the negative and the absence of the two, to explain every single concept. And at a certain moment my mind froze. Because it wasn't logical for the mind anymore, for the intellect. Mm -hmm. Then something happens beyond the intellect. And that's what I call the intuitive understanding. Then we have a whole bunch of intuitive understanding, which is not thoughts, not experience, not energies, not states, which is revealed. And that's where we find the real answers to our questions. That's where we realize who we are. Yeah. Okay, I think there is no reason to talk anymore about that, which cannot be explained anyway. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, maybe some wrap-up sentence. So then if we go back to what you were saying, Is there one technique or one method uh -huh. which can be used for everybody? My answer would be no. Each of us at different stages of our journey, we resonate with different teachers, teachings, practices. 
or simply nature, or a book, or a mountain. Yeah? And that's what's meant to be for us in that moment. Now, if that resonance creates more clarity and less confusion, wonderful. Because then it opens the mind to something else. And this seems to be the process. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't claim there's any truth. Because if I say there's a truth, all the people listening will get attached to that idea, and it'll close the mind. And create another religion. Exactly. Creates a dogma, a religion. Mm -hmm. Then it means I'm special, this is special, and I don't like that. I have, a, I have a dislike of any teacher or teaching that says, I am special, or satsang is special. And there are some very popular ones who are doing that. So I prefer to say, no, it can't be just one thing. We're all so unique, so you'll find what resonates with you and just keep checking it from your own direct experience. And that, I think, is what you mean by this brutal honesty, this radical honesty, mm -hmm. this authenticity, this vulnerability. And it's difficult for us because we've been grown up, brought up in a world where we're not used to accessing this part of ourselves which is vulnerable. But once we learn to do it, it's so beautiful. And there's so much here, so much information about who we are, right here, right now, which is beneficial, which brings more and more clarity. Then if ultimately realization happens or not, we can say it's grace. Some people talk about grace. My teacher used to talk about grace as well. And for me, grace is when the mind intellect has recognized I'm not the author of what is going to happen or not. If life gives me a deeper understanding, more clarity, if life makes it such that realization happens, it will happen. And at that point, the mind ego is not even attached to the idea of realization or no realization. It's completely open to what is in the present moment. Super. Thank you for explaining the unexplainable. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.